evening, saints, and welcome to OTOG. I am Judy Fentress Williams, and it is always my pleasure and privilege to be here with you all tonight studying God's Word, particularly the Old Testament. As we begin, we just want to affirm that we believe the Bible is God's inspired word, that God breathed through those who told and wrote these stories, that God was present in the process that creates the canon that we study and read today, and that it has authority and power in our lives. We want to pause and make sure we also say that saying that scripture matters, saying that it is inspired, is not the same thing as knowing how to read it and knowing what to do with it. And certainly we can look at almost any point in history and see the chaos that has been created when people have misinterpreted the Bible. So we want to make sure that you have opportunity to be exposed to a number of different approaches to the text. And when I show you the approach to scripture that I'm using, I want to make sure you understand that it is one approach. It is not the approach. Scripture is diverse and multifaceted. And so it makes sense that we should have more than one approach to scripture. I tell my students all the time, that whatever I'm giving them on any given week is a tool that they put in their toolbox. And anyone who's done any kind of work with tools knows that you can't use a hammer for everything, that a wrench won't work every single time. And so when we're studying the Bible, we want to have as many tools as we can so that we can rightly divide the word of truth. The approach that I use for the most part is a literary approach. I am interested not just in what the text says, but how it says it. So whenever I'm reading the Bible, I'm wondering why it says it this way, why those words are used, why this person's name is mentioned and this, one, this person's name isn't, or why the Bible rushes through one person's story and then stretches out and takes time to tell someone else. There is truth to be pulled from the genre or the style and the way that a story is told. And that how is just as important as the what. My literary approach, for the most part, would be described as a dialogic approach that is influenced by literary theory. A dialogic approach is a hermeneutic a way of reading the text that, that says that truth that we find in scripture is larger than any single person's head can hold. The truth is larger than my single consciousness, and I would go further and say the truth of scripture is larger than any single story, which is why the Bible constantly gives you multiple accounts. It's trying to train us to see the truth that speaks to who God is as larger than a single perspective. Dialogic truth is interested more in an event than a system. Stay with me here on this one because what I want to suggest to you is that sometimes we read a story in the Bible and we immediately want to fit it into something. Okay, so I'm reading about this Old Testament character and this person is like Christ. And you put them in a typological sequence or in a kind of pattern. And it can work in some ways and not work in others. A dialogic approach, this literary approach is going to ask you to just sit with the event itself. Sit with the story itself and listen to it in all of its nuances and peculiarities to see what else we can discern from this text. Another thing that I love about the dialogic approach is that it uses a word that I try to use every time, and that is unfinalizability. This concept that the truth of scripture keeps opening up in front of us, which is why we keep studying. We will never get all that there is to get out of the richness of God's word. And so this is the reason we keep coming back and studying and reading and learning more, getting more tools in our toolbox so that we can do all due diligence with the text. <laughs> 
In our first session of OTOG, we looked at dialogic criticism from the perspective of two stories. We have two creation stories, and one of the things that we learn in scripture is any story worth telling is going to be told more than once, and that these two stories are not a problem but a blessing. That together, these two stories give us a complex and richer understanding of God than any single story could on its own. When I'm teaching my Old Testament survey course, one of the assignments I'll give to my students is to look at the two creation stories and then imagine they were in a world where they had to pick one. Which one, I asked them, would they choose? And they realize how agonizing it is because the reality of the God we worship is larger than a single story. In our second week, we looked at a story in 2 Kings, and I asked you to think about the story from more than one perspective. That's a different kind of dialogue. When we read the story from the perspective of the widow, her problem gets solved, and we come away feeling one way about the story. But if we look at the story from the perspective of the sons or the unnamed sons and widows who don't have access to the prophet Elijah, then things change for us again. Tonight, I want us to look at a somewhat longer passage of scripture. I want us to look at Genesis 38. So take a minute and open your Bibles. The good news is Genesis is the first book of the Bible, and it won't take you too long to find it. And because the passage is long, I'm going to read it in sections, and then I'm going to stop and talk about that section. Then I'll read some more, and we'll talk some more, and we'll see how that works. So as we prepare to look at this text, I'm going to invite you to remember the three rules of engagement that I am asking you to use. Number one, try not to act like you've been in church your whole life, that your mother is the Virgin Mary and your father is the prophet Elijah, that perhaps you don't know everything and that maybe your Sunday school teacher's answers are not the only answer to a question. Number two, I want to invite you to read this text out loud. Reading out loud is going to force you to slow down a little bit. And that repetition of names and events is going to begin to have an impact on how you experience this story. When you have the time, read the story out loud. And then finally, number three, I'm going to ask you to make pretend that you are in godly play and ask the question, I wonder. Use your imagination and enter into spaces so that you can begin to engage this text and find out and discover that some of the truth of scripture will be engaged when you use your imagination. All right, here we go. Genesis 38 comes to us in a larger block of material that's the Joseph story. Joseph's story goes from Genesis 37 to 50. And we talk about this from a literary perspective as a beautifully structured narrative. It's a unified narrative. Except chapter 38, the one we're looking at, is described by some scholars as an interruption to this otherwise seamless narrative. Genesis 38 interrupts the Joseph story and I want to say that from a dialogic perspective, an interruption is another way of saying a dialogue. Genesis 38 is in conversation with the surrounding story. The Joseph narrative comes after the other ancestral narratives of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And so we've been following Abraham and Hagar and Sarah and Isaac and Rebecca and Jacob and Leah and Rachel. Rachel and Zilpah and Bilhah and them, all of their children. And now we come to um, the story of Joseph in chapter 37, where we discover that Jacob, a younger son who knew what it was like to grow up in a household where he was not daddy's favorite, repeats that same bad behavior by making Joseph the obvious favorite of his children. <laughs> 
this does not bode well for Joseph, and it doesn't help that Joseph doesn't quite know when to say things to his brothers and when not to say things to his brothers. Long story short, in chapter 37, Joseph, the favored child, come, is sent by his father to check on his older brothers. Um, they decide they've had enough of this dreamer. They throw him in a pit. They debate on what to do with him, and eventually um, decide on selling him into slavery. They strip the coat that his father had given him as a sign of favor. They put goat's blood on it and take it back to the father um, to tell their father that their son Joseph is dead. Jacob is grieving. Joseph is on his way on a caravan to go into slavery. And that's where chapter 37 ends. We are waiting with bated breath to find out what happens next when we come to Genesis 38, which cuts in with a very different story. Genesis 38, 1, and I'm reading from the New Revised Standard Version. It happened at that time that Judah went down from his brothers and settled near a certain Adulamite whose name was Hira. There Judah saw the daughter of a certain Canaanite whose name was Shua. He married her and went into her. She conceived and bore a son, and he named him Er. Again, she conceived and bore a son, whom she named Onan. Yet again, she bore a son, and she named him Shelah. She was in Chezib when she bore him. Let's stop right there. So the story begins now with Judah, Joseph's brother. Um, so we've cut away from the drama in the previous chapter, and now we have Judah kind of going off on his own to start his own family. And what does he do? He moves, he sees a woman, he marries her. Pay attention to what the text says. This is not very delicate at all. It says, he married her and went into her. Okay, we get it. And as a result of that, she conceives. She conceives and has a son named Er. Remember, in an ancient Near Eastern context where we have a patriarchal society, this is everything. A man wants to get married and have a son. She does that. And then it happens again. She has another son. And then it happens again. She has a third son. So she has um, Er, Onan, and Shelah. So, so far, so good. Things are going well for Judah. And a pattern has been established in this story of marriage and then children. Let's see what happens in the next section. Judah took a wife for Er, his firstborn. Her name was Tamar. But Er, Judah's firstborn, was wicked in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord put him to death. Then Judah said to Onan, Go into your brother's wife and perform the duty of a brother-in-law to her. Raise up offspring for your brother. But since Onan knew that the offspring would not be his, he spilled his semen on the ground whenever he went into his brother's wife so that he would not give offspring to his brother. What he did was displeasing in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord put him to death also. Then Judah said to his daughter-in-law Tamar, Remain a widow in your father's house until my son Shelah grows up, for he feared that he too would die like his brothers. So Tamar went to live in her father's house. Okay. In this second section, we have what should be the next generation of what happened in the first few verses. Judah marries, takes a wife, and has three sons. He then gets a wife for his firstborn, and then everything falls apart. For some reason, instead of him doing what his father did, which is to go into his wife so that she can conceive and bear a son, he does something wicked in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord put him to death. I wonder what Er did. I need to know. You might want to know as well, just so we can avoid doing it. Um, what does someone do that's so terrible that God would just put them to death? The text doesn't tell us. The text is less interested in this and something else. And we don't know what that is yet. Now, stay with me here because sometimes you're reading the Bible and you get to a piece like this. Er did something wicked and the Lord put him to death. And if you're like me, you get distracted. What did he do? The Bible doesn't tell us, but it continues on with its narrative. There's nothing wrong with wondering what Er did wrong. I still need to know. 
But the point I want to make here is that sometimes our questions and the trajectory of the story are not one and the same. When that happens, hold on to your question. We're not finished with the story. Maybe we'll find out, maybe not. And if we don't get an answer from the text, trust me, there are volumes that have been written on what Air might have done. I invite you to imagine what that might have been. You might also want to imagine what this says about God. Those are the kinds of questions that should be generated when we read a story like this. But we're not finished with this narrative yet. There's more, there's more that's going to happen. So after Er's death, Onan is called in by his father to fulfill his familial duty, which is to make sure that his sister-in-law has a male heir who can inherit on his deceased father's behalf. This is one of the ways, then, that a woman would have been provided for in a patriarchal society. Onan would then have a child with Tamar, who is considered Er's son. Er would be the son of, Er would be the, Er's heir. <laughs> I mean, he would produce Er's heir. And um, that's what he's supposed to do. This is called leveret marriage. Now, Onan doesn't want to do this. The text doesn't tell us why, but we can imagine why. He's thinking as a second born, hey, wait a minute. If my older brother doesn't have any children, that might mean a greater inheritance for me. The Bible doesn't say that. That's just my own thought. What we do know in the text is that when it's time for him to fulfill his duty to his, his sister-in-law, the Bible says he spilled his semen on the ground. If you've got King James Version, it says seed. He spilled his semen on the ground. I want to pause here because what we want to make sure we're clear on is that this act is uh, called coitus interruptus. That's the clinical term. This is not to be confused with masturbation. Um, that's not, the Bible's not talking about that. The Bible's talking about Onan's refusal to fulfill his obligation for his sister. And clearly that was a big deal because he was killed as well. Now Judah is down two sons. And he sends Tamar home to live with her father because she has a right to have a child with the last son, but he's not old enough yet. That's what happens in the second part of this story. So in the first 11 verses, we have this movement towards continuation of the family line that gets interrupted by Er and then Onan. And Tamar is in a waiting or holding pattern in her father's home. Let's keep going and read the next section. In the course of time, the wife of Judah, Shua's daughter, died. When Judah's time of mourning was over, he went up to Timnah to his sheep shears, he and his friend Hira the Adulamite. When Tamar was told, your father-in-law is going up to Timnah to shear his sheep, she put off her widow's garments, put on a veil, wrapped herself up, and sat down at the entrance to Anaim, which is on the road to Timnah. She saw that Shelah was grown up, yet she had not been given to him in marriage. When Judah saw her, he thought her to be a prostitute, for she had covered her face. He went over to her at the roadside and said, and again, these aren't pretty words, come let me come into you, for he did not know that she was his daughter-in-law. She said, what will you give me that you may come into me? He answered, I will send you a kid from the flock. And she said, only if you give me a pledge until you send it. He said, what pledge shall I give you? She replied, your signet and your cord and the staff that is in your right hand. So he gave them to her and went into her and she conceived by him. Then she got up and went away, and taking off her veil, she put on the garments of her widowhood. Oh, Lord, a whole lot happens in verses 12 to 19. So let's just walk through it a little bit. I can't tell you everything. We don't have time. Well, let me put it this way. I can't tell you everything I know, which is not everything. But let's just begin to scratch the surface. All right. When we last left this family, Tamar was with her father, and Judah was at home with his wife and his remaining child. The next thing that happens is that Judah's wife dies, and he enters into a period of mourning. 
The text's mention of Judah's period of mourning should remind you of another character who is also in mourning, and that is Tamar. All right? When his mourning time is over, he decides that he's going to go up and shear his sheep, which is ancient Near Eastern terminology for he's going to a convention. All right? She hears that that's what he's doing, and now she changes her clothes. It says she took off her widow's garments, put on a veil, wrapped herself up, and sat down at the entrance to Anaim, which is on the road to Timnah. She sat down on the way into the city, a place where you might find women who were sex workers. She did this, the text says, because she saw that Shayla was grown up and she had not yet been given to him in marriage. She's beginning to think Judah may not do what he said he was going to do. And sure enough, it works because when Judah saw her, he thought she was a prostitute. And Judah, the smooth talker that he is, comes over and says, come, let me come into you. She then negotiates a price. Once the price is agreed upon, she asks for a security deposit. Smart girl, that Tamar. And he gives her his pledge, his signet and his cord and his staff. This would have been his, um, his identifying markers, his driver's license, his American Express card. He gives her. And then they conduct business. And she changes her clothes and goes back to her widow's attire. Okay, let me just point out a couple of things here. The first thing I want to point out is what motivates Tamar's action. In 13, Tamar was told. She heard that he was doing this thing. And then it tells us because of what she heard, she changed her clothes and went and took a certain location because she saw she heard and she saw, but this seeing that's referred to, that Shayla was grown up, that's not literal seeing, it's perception. Perception matters because of all the other perceptions in this story. It says that when she changed her clothes and sat in the place where she sat, that Judah saw her in 15 and thought her to be a prostitute. Now, I want you just to contrast the seeing here. Tamar sees that she's not been given in marriage to Shayla, which causes her to take action. And her perception is right. Judah sees that she is sitting with a face covered and thinks that, he's a, that she's a prostitute. Judah's perception is wrong. He conducts business with her, except when you think about it, Tamar is the one who is in control here. This woman knows that it is time for her to conceive. She knows that he's coming on the way. And she puts herself in the place and time to get what it is that is promised to her. The text tells us in 18, she conceived by him and then changed her clothes again. I want you to pay attention to the changing of clothes in verses 12 through 19 because Judah takes off his widow's clothes to enter back into the society as someone who is finished with grieving. Tamar steps out of her widow's attire for a brief moment and goes back into her widow's attire. We'll come back to this in a moment. Let's go to the next section, 20 to 23. When Judah sent the kid by his friend, the Adulamite, to recover the pledge from the woman, he could not find her. And he asked the townspeople, where is the temple prostitute who was at Anaim by the wayside? But they said, no prostitute has been here. So he returned to Judah and said, I have not found her. Moreover, the townspeople said, no prostitute has been here. So Judah said, let her keep the things as her own, otherwise we will be laughed at. You see, I sent the kid and I could not find her. This is a lovely, lovely little section here because it not only moves the narrative along, but here's where we learn Judah assumed the woman was a temple prostitute. And so he says, where was the temple prostitute? And the response is, no prostitute has been here. Not only is the response no temple prostitute, but no prostitute. Now, I don't know whether that message gets perceived by Judah in the moment, but the text is trying to tell us something through the dialogue with Judah. There was no prostitute here. 
Okay. <sighs> okay, let me tell you one more thing. Um, so the, the other thing that's so important in this text in terms of perception is what Judah thinks he sees and what there is versus what Tamar perceives to be. Tamar puts um, a veil on her face, and that's the reason that Judah thinks she is a prostitute. This word for veil, sa'af, only appears twice in the Old Testament. Now think about that. There are lots of veils. There are lots of coverings. But this word we only see a few times. Once in this story, and we see it in the story of Isaac and Rebekah. Remember, Abraham sends a servant to go get a wife for his son Isaac. And Rebekah is coming back with Abraham's servant. She sees Isaac at a distance and asks, who is that? And the servant says, that's Isaac. And the Bible says she put a veil over her face, sa'af. So with that lovely intertextual reference, what we know is that this word doesn't necessarily mean or apply to what a prostitute would put on. In fact, when Rebecca puts it on, it's what a bride puts on. And ironically, when Tamar puts it on, Judah doesn't know it, but she's about to become a bride too. And so we get this lovely wordplay with what happens with this perception that's all tied to garments. The other thing we want to pick up is where she sits, the gate to Enaim. The entrance to Enaim is literally in Hebrew, the opening of the eyes. All right? This text has everything to do with perception. Judah's misperception again and again and again, and Tamar's ability to figure out exactly what is going on. And it all goes down at the entrance to Anaim, the opening of the eyes. You've got to love the Bible when you see how beautifully this is put together. Okay, let's get to the end. I'm sure we're running out of time here. Okay, verse 24. About three months later, Judah was told, your daughter-in-law Tamar has played the whore. Moreover, she is pregnant as a result of whoredom. Can we just pause here for a moment? Tamar didn't get pregnant by herself, all right? However, she's played the whore, okay. Um, Judah says, bring her out and let her be burned. Just like that. I'm sure in my mind it's with a wave of the hand. As she was being brought out, she sent word to her father-in-law, the owner of these who made, um, the, it was the owner of these who made me pregnant. Always keep your receipts. And she said, take note, please, who these are, the signet, the cord, and the staff. Then Judah acknowledged them and said, she is more in the right than I, since I did not give her to my son, Sheila, and he did not lie with her again for all of the things that Judah gets wrong. And there is a list. I do appreciate the fact that at the end, he acknowledges that he is wrong and she is in the right. That Tamar pursued what was rightfully hers and that according to the law of Leverett marriage, she must have a child by the next closest living relative, brother, husband, I'm mean, sorry, brother, father. All right, she pursues what is legally hers and Judah acknowledges that. Well, Judah didn't have a whole lot of choice, did he? Anyway, let's look at the end of this story. When the time of her delivery came, there were twins in her womb. While she was in labor, one put out a hand. Has this ever happened? A hand comes out. The midwife took and bound on his hand a crimson thread, saying this one came out first. But just then he drew back his hand, and out came his brother, whose name then is Breach. What a breach you have made for yourself. Therefore he was named Perez. Afterward his brother came out with the crimson thread on his hand, and he was named Zara, Brightness, perhaps making a, an allusion to the red or crimson thread that was on his wrist. This is an amazing story about the way in which a woman who is seemingly a powerless, childless widow is able to get what is rightfully hers. And some of it happens through not just her plan, but the changing of garments. And I want to suggest to you that the Bible is paying attention to garments because it is trying to make an intentional dialogue, if you will, with the larger Joseph story. 
Remember the story we just heard in chapter 37, that Joseph had a robe that showed his father's favor that was stripped from him. The robe was used to deceive Jacob into believing that his son was dead. The end of the Joseph story, Joseph's brothers encounter him and they don't know who he is. And I suspect they don't know who he is, A, because they didn't expect to see him in power. Maybe they never expected to see him again. But I also wonder if it had something to do with Joseph's position and Joseph's attire, that Joseph would have been dressed differently, that the clothes in these, story have, in these stories have a way of deceiving the characters in the story. And maybe part of what the Bible is trying to tell us as we begin to engage the story of Joseph is to pay attention not to what is just on the surface, but what is underneath. Don't be so much like a Judah who reads quickly by what he sees, but be more like a Tamar and perceive what's happening underneath. Joseph, in the larger story, succeeds because he's able to interpret And I wonder if what we want to do when we read the Bible is figure out how we're going to interpret and not just stick with what's on the surface. Dig deep, go underneath the text, begin to open it up and see what you will find. There are a couple of dialogues going on here. We've got the dialogue between the Tamar story and the larger Joseph story, where we see that garments... Serve, us, serve the function of revealing and covering. And I would make the case that in the Bible, the language through which God's word comes has the power to reveal and, un, um, to, to reveal and conceal, I think is what I want to say. That sometimes the language is um, over, over the surface of what's underneath that we want to get to. So we want to begin to think about language in the same way that we think about clothes. Not every veil is the same. Not every coat has the same meaning. And we want to begin, as we look at these words, to look underneath, underneath, underneath. Another dialogue in this passage, it seems to me, has to do with the dialogue between um, Tamar, this childless widow and the society that's put her in a box. The Tamar's perception and ability to risk enables her to get what is rightfully hers. And in this story, this is a model that is something that is to be honored and remembered as a part of the tradition. Tamar is one of the people who is mentioned in Jesus's genealogy in Matthew chapter 1, along with some other daring women who did the same things that is, risk to do what was rightfully theirs or to see how their um, risking could actually fulfill part of God's plan. Pay attention to the narrator in this story. The narrator is directing us and telling us things to give us hints on how to read the story. For example, when the narrator says, she, when she changed her clothes, she saw that Shayla was grown up. She, the narrator is explaining Tamar's behavior, which is another hint for our reading and interpretation. I want to invite you, as we continue to study, to pay attention to not just what the story says, but how it is said. Genesis 38 is not an interruption. It's a play within a play. It's trying to give us clues so that we can better understand the larger Joseph story, all the while remembering this important ancestress in the story of the people of Israel. I think we're going to stop there for now. And I invite you to continue to read the text as you develop a hermeneutic that allows you to imagine. And as we close out, we want to remember the names of some of the original gangsters, some of the early biblical scholars who helped open up biblical scholarship, teaching, and preaching for all of us. Dr. Brian Blount earned his PhD in New Testament studies from Emory University 
and is currently the president of Union Presbyterian Seminary in Richmond, Virginia. Dr. Abraham Smith earned his PhD in New Testament and Early Christianity from Vanderbilt University. Dr. Mignon Jacobs earned her PhD in Hebrew Bible from Claremont University. Thank you.